Okay, as we get started today, a couple things to uh, keep in mind. Um, be, be thinking about your topic for the research paper. Now uh, remember there's a, a list of um, topics available on Blackboard under assignments, so you can certainly use one of those. If you want to use something different, that's certainly a possibility. Just send me an email, that way I can look into some things, make sure there's going to be enough material for you to work with uh, uh, for your paper. Um, but be thinking about that and, and planning on, on that uh, so you can get to started in that. Secondly, uh, the, uh, the philosophy of ministry essay is coming up. Uh, there's still about two weeks or so uh, before that's due, but maybe be thinking about that, you know, looking back over some of the things we've talked about, uh, preparing for that uh, so that you're ready for that. Remember, it's just a preliminary version and then you'll be, have, be given the opportunity to revise um, with respect to uh, some things we talk about, uh, some things that we've read, uh, etc. So, uh, still, I want you to still put effort into it, certainly, uh, but uh, you know, just uh, remember you're going to have the chance to, to revise it toward the end of the semester. One of the things that you will do the most in your program here is write on some aspect of Bible, probably the biblical text, when it comes to research, um, assignments for papers and your courses, those kind of things. Um, not every course is going to have a research paper. Some are, are going to have other types of writing. But one of the things that you're going to do, whether we're talking about research in the context of the degree program here, or in the context of your ministry, is going to have to engage the biblical text in a variety of ways. But especially in trying to examine meanings and, and then try to make some sort of application to those meanings, uh, of those meanings to a congregation, a youth group, a Bible class, uh, some sort of situation like that. And in thinking about uh, those things, there, there's an important aspect to consistency in how you approach the text. And a uh, not only consistency, but a, a thorough method that endeavors to um, try to seek out the original meaning of the text. And that's largely what is meant by the term exegesis. Exegesis refers to the careful, systematic study of scripture to discover the original intended meaning. And so the goal behind exegesis is to engage the text in such a way to examine what the original intent of the words of the Bible was. Now, in many respects, of course, our interests are going to be a current situation, a particular issue, something that's related to the situation we find out, we find ourselves in today. But there are some important reasons why we do, we want to do exegesis and discover the original intended meaning. First of all is that there is that idea of what we might call eisegesis. If exegesis is getting into the text and to pull out of the text what the meaning was, eisegesis is to take our own personal interests, preconceptions, ideas, and reading them back into the text. <laughs> if we read the Bible with the effort uh, or the intention of trying to prove a point. We are not looking for the meaning of the original text. We are instead advancing our own agenda. And then if we share that agenda, right, oh, this is what the Bible says, then we are not speaking as the oracles of God, which is what Peter encourages us to do in 1 Peter 4, verse 11. If anyone speaks, let that one speak as the oracles of God. And so there's a consistent danger that we will uh, sometimes 
read into the text things that don't belong there, and then try to apply that in a uh, perhaps uh, in inappropriate way. Um, let's look at Psalm chapter 23. Pretty familiar psalm. Probably one that if you haven't drawn some strength and comfort, especially in the context of losing a loved one, uh, from if you haven't drawn that from yet, there will be some, some point in your life where you turn to this passage for, for some sort of comfort. And that's not to say that this that, that's not an, a legitimate use for this, but somebody read for us Psalm 23, uh, verses 5 and 6. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup on the thorns. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now, if I focus simply on trying to get, uh, doing an application of this text, and I'm not careful about some things about reading uh, out of the text instead of into the text, I might come up with the opinion that uh, this passage teaches that one's true enemies, one's true enemies are within the church. You say, how... How would you get that out of this passage? Well, it says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and the house of the Lord is the church. And since God sets the table for us in the presence of our enemies, and we're dwelling in the house of the Lord, the church, then one's true enemies must be in the church. Doesn't that sound right? I say, no, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> right. It, just on the face of it, we say, well, that, that, that seems kind of ridiculous. But if we're not careful, we can fall into those kind of traps. Now, that's certainly an extreme example. But just the idea of reading into the text, or not being careful with how we handle the text, can lead us to a variety of extremes that may or may not be something that was originally intended. Now, taking this, this passage and using it for comfort in the face of losing loved ones, or, or uh, you know, in the, in, in the midst of struggle, that seems to be a valid application of the text. David, of course, is talking about you know, the comfort that is given to him because God is his shepherd. So we have to be careful both that we are making sure we are understanding the original meaning of the text and we are not carrying some things into the text that don't belong there. Connected with this, the practice of exegesis is the practice of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics refers to the principles of interpretation of a text. This, in a sense, is, right, if exegesis is the process of determining what a text meant, hermeneutics is the process of understanding what a text means. Right, so we might say contemporary application. Now, we're not going to spend too much time of um, you know, uh, talking about hermeneutics, we will talk a little bit about applying and, and theology and those kind of things, because there's an entire course you have to take called biblical interpretation. And so the, the focus of that course is on uh, developing both uh, good exegetical method but also good hermeneutical method. But why, why even bother with talking about exegesis? Why not just go to what the text means today, right? It's, it's not like we can transport ourselves back to first century coin, for example, uh, and, and have the immediate meaning of the text. Why not just look at what the text means instead of trying to engage what the text meant first? Some passages don't apply to us today. Okay, maybe some passages don't apply to us today. Why else? Might we start with Jesus first? Well, it's easier to understand the context, to get a better context, to get a better context of what is what that particular passage is um, trying to relate. All right, so understanding the context and, and what the text, what the text is trying to relate. 
Any other thoughts about why we should start with exegesis? I think one, in addition to what's already been said, one of the dangers is that we might make the text say what it wasn't originally intended to say. If it did not mean something in the original context to those original hearers, we have to be careful to try and make it mean something to us today. Right? And so some people would argue, and I don't know if this would be totally uh, applicable, but some people would argue a text cannot mean what it never meant. Right, so if it didn't mean something to those people, it cannot mean that to us today. Uh, and I don't know if that would, I don't know if I'd be confident in saying that 100% absolutely. Uh, I think in a lot of cases that's true, but that's one thing we have to, to be careful of. Before we get into um, talking about a process of exegesis, there are a couple other things to be aware of and mindful of when it comes to biblical study that, uh, that we we want to address before getting into the procedure of exegesis. First of all, is that in many cases, most of us will be using the Bible in, in translation. In many respects, this is, even though you have to, as part of your degree plan, take a year of Hebrew or a year of Greek or maybe more, depending on what degree plan you're in, most of us probably aren't going to rely too heavily on reading from the Greek or Hebrew text. Most of us are going to be reading from uh, a translation. And so it's important to recognize some things about translations that are important in biblical study. Now, let's first start off with some important terms related to translation before we get into talking about some theories and, and other things. First of all, is the idea of the original language. This, of course, is the language that is being translated from. Now, in the context of the Bible, what would the original languages be? Hebrew, Greek. Hebrew, Greek. And? Latin. Not Latin. Aramaic. Aramaic. And in, in early Christian writings, um, there's some Latin and there's some uh, translations into Latin, but the original languages would be Hebrew, Greek, and then there's a little bit of Aramaic in the Old Testament in places like Daniel and Ezra. Um, not major sections, but there are some. So the original languages refer to the language you're translating from. You translate into the receptor language. The receptor language, of course, in this context would be English. A third term, important to re remember, is a historical distance. Now, some of this would be the issue of the distance between our time and the text, right, when those things happened, when those things were written. But it also refers to differences that exist between the original language and the receptor language in terms of words, grammar, idiom, culture, history, right? There's so much that separates us from that original text, that original writing, that has to be a part of thinking about those aspects of uh, the uh, study of the Bible. Fourth term refers to the theory of translation. Right, how do you bridge the gap between, how do you bridge the historical distance between the receptor, or excuse me, the original and the receptor language? Now, in one sense, and, and this is the way that a lot of people in the pew, so to speak, look at this issue. Why not just find an English term for the Greek term and Hebrew term, and that's how you translate it. Right? And so you just find an English term for the Greek or Hebrew, or the Aramaic. Seems like it should be a simple process. Why do we have so many translations? Let's take a look at just one passage. One passage that I think uh, complicates a lot of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 36. 
I'm going to need three different readers. One, somebody to read from the King James or the New King James, somebody to read from the New American Standard, and somebody to read from the NIV. All right, let's start with King James. What is the first Corinthians chapter one? Verse thirty-six. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely towards his virgin, if she pass the flower of rage, and he so require, let him do what he will, he did it not, let them marry. All right. So first of all, there's some difficulty in understanding the King James sometimes in general. But you have this idea expressed in, in the King James, and it's also expressed in the, the New King James, about here is a man, and Paul is concerned that he's going to behave improperly toward his virgin. And so there's also this issue of her getting older, and, and so he has to make the decision about whether she's going to marry or not. And it's not a sin, Paul says, let them marry. But what does he mean by virgin? Okay. Who has the New American Standard? What the New American Standard is? Right. But if any man thinks that he is acting on the coming way toward his virgin daughter, and she is past her youth, and if it, is, and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let her marry. Okay, so... The New American Standard here doesn't hold on to this idea of virgin, right? but instead helps us out here and say, uh, this virgin daughter. Right? So evidently what Paul is talking about is that here's a man, Christian man, and, and he knows, based on Paul's uh, explanation, Paul's expectations, that if his daughter gets married, she could be drawn away from the Lord, let's say. But she's getting older, and so you know he's concerned about this. And so Paul says, "It's okay, you know, let her get married." Seems pretty simple. Right? We we originally didn't quite understand too much what what King James and the New King James meant by behaving improperly towards your virgin. But now the New American Standard helps us out and says, "Virgin daughter." Somebody read for us the same verse from the New International. If one is worried that he might not be acting honorably for the virgin he is engaged to, and if, he ha if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not saying when they should be a man. Is, is there a big difference between your virgin daughter and the virgin you're engaged to? Yeah. There is quite a bit of difference between your virgin daughter and your fiancé. So what we started with the King James. If anyone's behaving improperly toward his virgin, we said, well, we're not really sure what that means. Let me turn to the New American Standard. It says virgin daughter. Okay, now I get it. Right? And so here's this guy, and he wants to protect his daughter, but Paul says, it's okay, she can get married. But then we look at the New, uh, New International and it says that you're behaving improperly towards your fiancé. Right? And so here are two people, probably. They're, they're engaged. But based on Paul's advice and some other teachings, they think, you know, we're just going to hold off uh, getting married, right? And, and so we're engaged, we're committed to each other, but we're not going to get married. But Paul's saying maybe those passions uh, are burning, right? Maybe there's that, that pull towards sexual activity, but you're not married, right? And so, you know, you've got the temptation on the one hand, but you've got this commitment on the other hand. Paul says it's not the same for the two of you to get married. So the, the simple translation of going from the Greek and finding the English equivalent isn't all that simple. Because you have, I mean, the, the King James translates it fairly literally. If you're behaving improperly towards your burden. But again, that, that to translate it literally doesn't always give us the sense. Now, it's probably more likely than not the fiancé. It seems to make more sense in the context of what Paul's talking about with the fiancé. But you know, what happens here is that we have this attempt to try and make sense of some things in the Greek that aren't necessarily something we understand in English. 
right? Just like there are a lot of shortcuts in English, there are a lot of shortcuts in Greek where you could say something, and the readers of this, you know, the original readers, the audience understood this language, Greek or Hebrew, whatever, knew what you were talking about. But in these intervening years, we don't have as, as clear of an idea. So, for example, um, in this passage we'll, we'll talk about uh, probably later today, if we get to it, um, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, there's this beautiful passage. Uh, you know, Praise be to God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he protected us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. And goes on and says, and there's a lot of beautiful things here about what the benefits are in Christ. In Greek, it is one long sentence with no verb. 